Good evening, and welcome uh, to today's talk, everyone. Uh, Appomattox, the end of the Civil War. This is one of our signature talks in the Destinations and Discovery series sponsored by Cavalier Travels in the University of Virginia's Office of Engagement. Uh, Cavalier Travels is the university's educational travel program. We offer a variety of trips throughout the year with UVA faculty and staff, and we will uh, We'll place a link to our website in the uh, chat area in case you'd like to take a look to learn about our upcoming trips. Um, my name is Kevin Connolly, and I'm the Senior Director of UVA's Alumni and Parent Travel Program. Um, let's see, before we uh, get started, I'd like to highlight a couple webinar logistics. One is that we are recording today's program, and we'll share a link to the recording in a follow-up email in case you would like to revisit the conversation. Um, we will also post a link on the Cavalier Travels webpage. Um, at any time during the webinar, you may use the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen to submit questions for our speaker. And we will get to as many as possible with the time that we have, but this is a pretty large crowd today, so um, we might not be able to get through uh, as many as we would like, of course. Um, if you pre-submitted a question when you registered, we have it in our list of questions, so you don't need to submit it again today. Um, and now I'm in, in, uh, pleased to introduce this evening's speaker, speaker Caroline Janey. Um, Carrie is an author and historian whose scholarship focuses on the Civil War, memory, and women and gender. She holds a BA in government and a PhD in history from the University of Virginia, and she is the John L. Now III Professor in the History of the American Civil War and Director of the John L. Now III Center for Civil War History at UVA. Caroline has published and edited several books and is also the author of numerous articles on the Civil War she is an active public lecturer and has given presentations at locations across the globe. Caroline is the past president of the Society of Civil War Historians and a series editor for the University of North Carolina Press's Civil War America series. We are grateful to have Caroline with us today uh, to share her expertise and insights in today's, on today's topic, Appomattox at the end of the Civil War. Caroline, welcome, and I will turn it over to you and join you later in the program when we transition to questions from our audience. All right. Thank you so much, Kevin. And before we get to the stories of, of all of these different individuals, I want to point out two key things. The first is that the terms that were given at Appomattox, that were agreed upon at Appomattox, were not a peace treaty. There was never a peace treaty signed during the American Civil War. Indeed, if the United States had offered to sign a peace treaty and peace treaties were signed between political leaders, not military leaders, that would have compromised the United States' insistence that it was a rebellion, that, that the Confederacy was in fact legitimate. So Appomattox was the surrender of a single army. It was not the legal end to the Civil War. Equally as important, Grant's terms sent Lee's soldiers home as paroled prisoners of war. And we sometimes gloss too quickly over this, but in fact, they were prisoners of war in which the other option was that they would be sent to paroled, or rather to, to prison camps. For Grant, letting Lee's soldiers go home as quickly as possible was key to restoring the Union. It was both practical and pragmatic. And as such, on the morning after the surrender, on April 10th, he issued a special field orders that stated that all officers and men of the Confederate service paroled at Appomattox Courthouse to reach their home, are compelled to pass through the lines of the United States armies, will be allowed to do so and to pass free on all government transports and military railroads. Lee had asked how they would have proof that indeed they were paroled. And so this is where we come up with the parole passes that you may have seen. Printed there on the field at Appomattox, filled out by the Confederate soldiers, and we could potentially talk about this in the Q&A if people are interested. And if you have ever come across one of these passes and you've noticed stamps on it, this is where Confederate soldiers took advantage of Grant's promise, at least initially, that they could use government transports, that they could use steamers and railroads, or that they could stop at a Union Provost Marshal's office and get rations. So again, they are paroled prisoners of war making their way home. Disbanding Lee's army marked the first and most important step in an enormous process of demobilizing the Confederate forces. And in many ways, it was just as important as mobilizing men in 1861. It involved tens of 
thousands of men across a vast landscape. And it proved far more drawn out at that time that, than the people at that time or since have understood. It involved the story of civilians, free and enslaved, of Union and Confederate soldiers, of men and women, and it underscored, perhaps most importantly, the uncertainty and the unforeseen consequences of ending a civil war. Tonight, what I'd like to do is offer you a glimpse into a few of the stories of the men who were there at Appomattox. Indeed, for many of Lee's men, the story began before the surrender, before they participated in this famous surrender ceremony that took place on April 12th. But after April 12th, the men who were left in the ranks of Lee's army, approximately 28,000 of them, began to make their way home. Some of them left in pairs, maybe a, a couple of men heading home. Perhaps if they're heading throughout Virginia, they, they might have struck out in, in groups of two, maybe a half dozen. But other groups marched away as companies, as brigades, and even as divisions. Indeed, that was the case for Captain William Henry Harder and his regiment, the 23rd Tennessee, that marched out of Appomattox on the morning of April 13th, bound for their homes in Southwest Virginia and in Tennessee. Leaving that evening, Harder observed, he kept a diary as many men did on their way home. He observed that Confederates were now, quote, free to go where we liked, but the men had not broken from the ranks. Instead, on they marched, four abreast, brigade following brigade, regiment after regiment. Again, this is a, a, a surprising sort of thing that I found in, in working on this book, that men are marching away from Appomattox as units, not just drifting away as we might think of Ashley Wilkes and Gone with the Wind of stumbling home as an individual soldier. Most of them initially left by foot, unless they were lucky enough to commandeer a mule or a broken down horse along the way. And in their diaries and letters, many of them comment on their good fortune in doing so. They started south, heading to the Carolinas, to Georgia, to Tennessee, Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, Arkansas, and Texas. Some kept to the roads, but others followed the, the muddy ravines, the hog trails, the stream beds, anything that would allow them to stay out of the path of Union soldiers that were still in the South. Some headed east toward the, the railroad junction at Burksville, intentionally searching for Union soldiers because they thought if they could meet to, make their way to Burksville, they could hop on the train and that would make their trip to the east easier. They wanted to make good use of Grant's promise that they could ride free on government-owned trains and steamers and to get rations. Others headed west toward the Blue Ridge Mountain to begin their trek southward. A significant number headed due south from Appomattox to Danville, Virginia, the closest railroad head where they thought they might catch a train to Greensboro and beyond. Throughout the Carolinas and into Georgia, they clambered onto railroad cars, some so crowded that they had to sit on top of the boxcars, as you see in this image. A significant number of soldiers from the Deep South, however, had first made their way from Appomattox to City Point or to Fortress Monroe, where they hoped to board steamers and sail south, where they would make their way to ports such as Savannah, New Orleans, and beyond. Finding food remained almost as challenging as securing transportation. Again, the United States had offered rations, but there weren't enough rations for Union soldiers, much less for Confederate soldiers. Men might make their way to a post only to show up to find that there were no rations left. Some of them then turned to the Confederate government. Even though the Confederate government had been hard pressed to feed its armies in the last days of the war, there still remained across the South government stores that, that held all sorts of provisions for soldiers. A day's march south from Appomattox, Major General Brian Grimes and his North Carolinians and, and the, what remained of his division, came upon a small country store where they encountered nearly a hundred paroled soldiers who had already made their way to this store, along with the wives of Confederate soldiers. The store had served as a distribution center for needy soldiers' wives. They could come and attain rations, and on this particular day, they had arrived to attain their rations of meat. But the paroled soldiers insisted that 
that they were des des deserved food as well. While the women might be entitled to the meat, they demanded that the store owner turn over his cow peas to them. When the shop owner refused, Grimes, still wearing the uniform of a Confederate soldier, still commanding his troops, and still in possession of his sidearms, as officers were allowed to do after Appomattox, insisted that he maintained control. And because these cowpeas had been intended for Confederate soldiers, he commandeered them. He said they belonged to the Confederate government and they then belonged to his men. The store owner finally relented, prompting a scramble among the soldiers. They shoved peas into their haversacks and pockets. They emptied containers that they found in the store and filled everything that they could. One ingenious young soldier pulled off his pants and made them into a sack by tying the, the pants legs together. And then he proceeded to fill them with cow peas. Off he marched, recalled an amused comrade, with the peas in the forked sack around his neck. But with tens of thousands of, of Confederate soldiers traversing the countryside, it was civilians who bore the brunt of providing sustenance. Some gave willingly, but not all were so willing to share. Indeed, Confederate soldiers kept lists in their diaries documenting just who was willing to share and who was not. As they dispersed across the countryside, they encountered both those who were, were willing to support them, giving them their last morsel, as well as devoted unionists who decided that there was no way they were ever going to, to support the Confederacy. And then there were those who had supported the Confederacy, but had been left with absolutely nothing after Confederate impressment agents had swept through the region, taking every last morsel that they had to eat. Many of them refused to give any more for a cause that they now believe to be lost. In the pro-unionist areas of Eastern Tennessee, where Captain Harder and his men were making their way, they discovered how much they were not welcome. Arriving in Sullivan County on April 23rd, his men were in desperate straits. Again, he was keeping a diary on his way home and he noted, quote, all are nearly starved, naked, and befuddled. The locals refused to feed them, but they did offer Harder and his men a warning. We were told that every Confederate that went through or attempted to go through Eastern Tennessee were killed and that we would meet the same fate. Yet even in regions that remained sympathetic to the Confederacy, the refusal or the inability of civilians to provide food led some Confederate soldiers to resort to violence and to plundering, just as Union and Confederate officials had feared. Georgian Lieutenant David uh, Champion, for example, and his traveling companions became outraged when an older Confederate man in the Carolinas refused to accept Confederate money for corn and bacon. He too was keeping a diary. This is what he had to say. Seeing as it was useless to try to trade with them, I ordered the boys to go to his corn crib and smokehouse and get the corn and bacon we needed. We carried the corn to a mill nearby on the creek and ground it and borrowed his wash pot to cook the meat in. Uh, lots and lots of examples of this sort of thing. In several instances, Lee soldiers turned to looting and pillaging. This happened in several cities in North Carolina. Um, it happened in Greensboro and Charlotte. It also happened in Georgia. On May 1st, upon reaching Augusta, Georgia, a mob of Confederate soldiers began looting, again, the government stores, these warehouses that were meant to provide for, for Confederate soldiers, excuse me, and they began pillaging locally owned shops as well. Yet the local city newspaper tried to rationalize their actions. Using the same logic as Confederate officers, such as Brian Grimes, that believed these men were do their part, that they should at the very least be fed for compensation for their services, mobs of Confederate soldiers began raiding the Confederate stores. They said that, that what they were doing, uh, they were entitled to. They had been fighting. They had been, been hungry for months on end now, and they were entitled to those sources. Newspapers and civilians alike explained that Confederate soldiers had fought valiantly. They had fought bravely, only to be overwhelmed by superior Northern resources. And this is a refrain that would pick up in the post-war years. 
would become part of the lost cause, that Confederate soldiers hadn't abandoned the cause, they hadn't been defeated, they had been overwhelmed by Northern resources. Of course, the local newspapers in Augusta said they should not be looting stores, especially privately owned stores, but they were entitled to government warehouses. Many Confederate sympathizers believed that these actions could be forgiven as part of the social contract that implied soldiers, especially those who had given their all, were to be fed. They could explain away this. They didn't see this as an attack on their communities. Again, there are so many of these stories that we could follow along the way, but I'd like to turn now to the story of one particular story that highlighted the uncertainty of what it meant to be a paroled rebel in the wake of Appomattox. And that's the story of Thomas Murray. We don't actually have an image of him, but this is another unidentified soldier who was part of his initial regiment. Tom Murray Jr. had been born in Fairfax Courthouse, Virginia in 1843. When the war began in 1861, he was an 18-year-old college student attending Georgetown University in, in the District of Columbia. That summer, like so many other men of his age, he enlisted in a, a Virginia regiment. He enlisted in the 17th Virginia, eventually part of Pickett's division. And he served with that unit until 1864, when he was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the 1st Battalion of the Virginia Infantry. He had made it all the way to Appomattox, and you can find his name among those who were paroled at Appomattox in his compiled service record. And at Appomattox, he decided that on his trip home, he would search out some of those comrades that he had joined up with in the summer of 1861, some of the local boys from Fairfax, and make their way back to Northern Virginia. Along the way, he had been fortunate enough to find a dilapidated horse on which to travel. And alongside this group of young men, they traversed muddy roads, boarded swollen streams, camped in bushes along the roadsides when no houses could be found. But only a day's ride from his home, Tom's fortunes turned for the worse. When they reached the outskirts of Warrington in Fauquier County, they learned of Lincoln's assassination, and they quickly learned how irate Union soldiers were in this area. It also didn't help that John Singleton Mosby, the famed guerrilla, had been refusing to surrender himself, and this was in the heart of what was then known as Mosby's Confederacy. Murray was intent on getting home because he had just learned that his father had passed away and he wanted to make his way home to his grieving mother. But his comrades urged him that he should not cross into Union lines, that it was much too dangerous. Nevertheless, he felt certain that the parole pass that he held in his hand from Appomattox would ensure him safe passage that would ensure him protection to make his way to his home. Indeed, Grant had promised as much in Special Field Orders Number uh, 173, issued at, excuse me, uh, Number 73, issued on April 10th, the day after the surrender. But again, as the manhunt for Lincoln's uh, assassins was well underway, Union troops throughout the area were, were stationed in Fauquier County and searching for any Confederates that they might detain. He's then immediately detained upon crossing into Fauquier County. He is taken to the local provost marshal's office and he pleads with the men there that he's just learned of his father's death and he wants to make it home to his mother. Two sympathetic members of the provost guard relented. They told him that he would be allowed to go home for one evening, spend that evening with his grieving mother, but they would be waiting for him because he was a paroled prisoner of war and he would be in their custody again the next morning. Indeed, they allowed him to go home, but the following morning they returned and these United States soldiers carried him off on a bumpy and jarring ride along a, uh, on a lumber wagon along a corduroy road to Fairfax Station where he boarded a train along with a host of other Confederates bound for who knows where. Soon he realized that he had been taken to Alexandria and despite his parole, he and others were hauled before the local provost marshal where their names were recorded in a book. From there, Union guards marched them to a large empty room and confined them alongside some other two to 300 other Confederates 
many of them members of the 17th Virginia, local men who had likewise made their way home. But as his eyes began to adjust to the darkness, Murray started to realize precisely where he was being held. He had been taken to a military prison in the former Bryce, Birch, and Company slave jail on Duke Street in Alexandria, one of the largest and most notorious slave markets in the country. The son of a Fairfax attorney who owned seven enslaved people in 1860, Murray and his fellow Confederates could not have escaped the indignity. Men who had gone to war to protect their slaveholding nation now found themselves confined in the very pens from which they had bought and purchased the flesh of other individuals. Indeed, it seems likely that Murray's father had purchased enslaved people from this very slave market. Later that evening, those prisoners with parole passes in hand were marched back to the provost marshal who promptly shredded those, those uh, cherished passes from Appomattox and filled out new parole passes. Uh, this led some of the rebels to be absolutely indignant, but it didn't matter. They were paroled prisoners of war. Indeed, in the coming days and every day throughout late April of 1865, the Alexandria Gazette would print the names of returning rebel prisoners so that local unionists might know that there were indeed rebels in their midst. If this wasn't enough, the commission, uh, commissioning officers were placed in a row and one by one, a US, sergeant, uh, a U.S. sergeant had them step forward and he would cut off their insignia with scissors. He would snip their brass buttons from their uniforms, then the bars and stars from their collars. Stripped of their rank and proof that they had remained with Lee's army until the bitter end, Murray and his comrades were released to be sent to their homes again as paroled prisoners. And you can, can see from this newspaper clipping, this is precisely how they're being described. They're not citizens once more. Their status is very much up in the air. Murray and the approximately 75,000 other Confederates who headed home to loyal territories, both in Union portions of Virginia, but also in the loyal border states of Maryland, Kentucky, Missouri, and, and West Virginia, generated a host of new anxieties, so much so that citizens in both Maryland, and you can see that the counties here, the counties that are, are noted with the, the horizontal lines, these are counties where vigilante committees were created in order to prevent Confederates from returning to their homes. The same thing happened in West Virginia in the weeks after Appomattox. All of this was intending to make sure that rebels didn't return to their midst. And it is a reminder that Appomattox was not the end. In fact, for many, it is the very beginning. It's the beginning of a host of questions. Should rebels be allowed to return to the communities that considered them having committed acts of treason? Were they United States citizens with all the rights bestowed by the Constitution? Would they have to take oaths of allegiance to return home? If they refused, what would happen to them? The degree to which the terms offered at Appomattox would serve to ease them back into some post-war life were very much up for grabs at this point. It was an incredible period of uncertainty and turmoil. And for none more so was this a period of uncertainty than for the enslaved African-Americans who were finding an, a new path to freedom. Africans, African Americans, excuse me, um, quickly noted that in fact, the Confederates had lost the war. As one formerly enslaved man from Alabama noted, I saw our Confederates go off laughing and gay. They had departed for the war singing Dixie, certain that they were going to win, but now they return skin and bones, their eyes hollow, their clothes ragged. In occupied Charleston, South Carolina, members of the 54th Massachusetts took notice as well. As one noted, quote, from the paroled armies of the defunct Confederacy came large numbers of soldiers in dilapidated garments and emaciated physical condition. Their destitution was so great, this veteran noted, they are glad to share the rations of our colored soldiers. Not sure that's completely the case, 
And we need to keep in mind that the stories of Black men um, were both in the Union Army and those who had been compelled to accompany the Confederates as well. There were hundreds, if not thousands, of enslaved men who were still with the Army of Northern Virginia at Appomattox. And for them, making their way home after the end of the war, or what was becoming the end of the war, was, was just as much of a challenge as it was for rebel soldiers. They had choices to make. Would they accompany their former masters home? Would they strike out on their own? Was it safer to accompany their former enslavers home? Would that offer some degree of protection? Many of this, many of them recognized that slavery had not completely ended yet. And all of the, there, there, there were no safeguards that, that prevented them from, from feeling the retribution at the hands of former rebels. Uh, this is no more apparent than in Confederate soldiers' encounters with United States colored troops as they made their way home. One example of this took place um, in Savannah, Georgia in, in uh, late April of 1865. In late April, the Wilmington had steamed into the Savannah port with 690 paroled rebels, including David Gear and other members of Finnegan's Florida Brigade, who claimed that they had already killed two United States Colored Troop soldiers back in Virginia. In Georgia, their deadly retaliation continued. While waiting at the port of Savannah for a ship to Jacksonville, they claimed that a black sentinel had stomped on their campfire. Enraged by this, they plotted his execution. Using a surgeon's knife, they slashed the black soldier's throat, then tossed him and all evidence of the crime into the river. When white officers grew suspicious about the missing black soldier, Gear and 63 other Florida soldiers that were awaiting steamers to take them home fled in the middle of the night rather than, than face the consequences of meeting their fate with white Union soldiers. Indeed, for the third time since leaving Appomattox, they had killed black soldiers and gotten away with it. Other interactions with black soldiers proved less deadly, but no less revealing of how much the social order had changed. At Selma, Alabama, US officers had ordered members of Hood's Texas Brigade to disembark a train so that USCT regiments might travel. And several days later at New Orleans, the Texans again found themselves guarded by USCT Company, a slight that Captain W.T. Hill of the 5th Texas believed to be intentionally demeaning. Even more humiliating for the Confederates, the Black soldiers had taken to cutting off the rebels' buttons of their coats. The Texans were quick to catch on, Hill observed, and by cutting off their brass buttons themselves, denied them the great satisfaction of doing so. You see, in the wake of the surrender, Black soldiers guarding paroled Confederates, cutting buttons off their coats, or taking precedence in travel embodied the world turned upside down. The presence of Black men in uniforms, perhaps more than the surrender at Appomattox itself, represented the death of the Confederacy and a new racial order. There is so much more to this story, so many more stories to tell but I'd like to leave you with this. Rather than serving as a clear ending to the war, the surrender and the trek home of Lee's soldiers brought into stark relief many of the social, the political, and the legal questions that had plagued the war from its very beginning. Perhaps most important, there had never been a golden moment when Lee's soldiers, or even their civilian supporters, had been so thoroughly subjugated that they were willing to accept any conditions. For Confederate soldiers and their civilian supporters, surrendering to Union forces did not mean admitting that their cause was wrong. As one Shenandoah Valley newspaper assured its readers as early as April 21st, quote, generally surrendered not rights of conscience, no sentiment or feeling of affection for his country. We are still proud of our country, I, if possible, prouder than ever, and still love it with a devotion intensified by her misfortune. I want to point out that by our country, speaking of the Confederacy, not the United States. So if anything, the humiliation of registering at Provost Marshall's offices, 
being detained by Union troops, having buttons and insignia removed, the presence of Black and white occupying troops. Indeed, the very trip home itself emboldened rebels' claims of Southern righteousness and Northern barbarity. The disbanding of Lee's army had not marked the end of the nation's division. Indeed, it was only the beginning, foreshadowing much of what will play out in the decades to come. Thank you. Fantastic, Carrie. Thank you so much. That was very entertaining. And uh, once education. I got my slides working right. <laughs> once you get your slides working right, that's right. Well, we have had a number of uh, questions come in um, during the uh, course of your talk. Um, let's see. One was, uh, didn't Grant allow the Confederates and the cavalry to keep their horses and ride them home? So, yes. So all horses that belong to Confederate soldiers, they were allowed to keep. And so the cavalry in particular had to, in the Confederacy, cavalrymen had to provide their own horses. So yes, they were uh, allowed to keep them unless, the, the caveat there is unless they had a U.S. brand on them. So they were horses that had been at, at some point taken from, from unions, captured from union soldiers. So otherwise, right. yes, that's the case. Okay. One of the pre-submitted questions was about where, where was Lee headed when he was stopped at Appomattox? Well, that's a great question. So you know, we we talk about the road to Appomattox. There's the various ways in which we talk about the end of the war as if Lee was always headed to Appomattox. When Lee breaks out of the trenches at Petersburg and, and out of the fortifications surrounding Richmond on April 2nd and into April 3rd, he's heading for the, the only viable railroad line. And that railroad line is the one that that runs west. And he even he has to keep switching that position because he wants to make his way south. He's trying to hook up with Joe Johnston, who's down in North Carolina. And so he's thwarted along the way continually by Sheridan, who's been brought in from the valley. But at Appomattox, it's it's not Appomattox per se that he's trying to make his way to. At, at that point, he's trying to make his way to Lynchburg. But the key is always to hit that railroad junction that will take him south because he's actually he heading toward toward Johnston, who ends up at Durham Station. Hmm. Interesting. Another question that I found interesting was like, how many other units or um, armies kept fighting after Northern Virginia surrendered? So the place of Lee's army within the Confederacy is so substantial, not just be because of where it is in Virginia, but but where it is in the, the mines. It is the Confederacy, more so than the Confederate government. Lee and his army have become the symbol of the Confederacy. So it is symbolically the most important. And when Lee surrenders, this does start a domino effect. Uh, he does not have the largest army. He has about 60,000 men when he leaves Richmond and, and Petersburg combined on April 2nd and 3rd. But the far larger force that hadn't surrendered yet was Joe Johnston's, who had somewhere around 90,000 men. So... Mm. Uh, again, Lee is trying to, to hook up with him, but it becomes clear as his men are making their way south, they're bringing with them as they, they make their way into North Carolina, not just rumors, but they're telling people that in fact, Lee has surrendered. And there's a lot of disbelief at first among both locals and those uh, members of, of Joe Johnson's army that are spread out in a, a tremendous arc. They're not all together the way Lee's army was. So you have Joe Johnston's forces in North Carolina. There's I, I talk a lot about this in the book, the, the negotiations that will quickly happen for surrender there to Sherman. It happens finally by April 26th. And then Kirby Smith still has a force that is in the Trans-Mississippi, so west, west of the the Mississippi River, a, a much smaller force. He will surrender in May. But Lee's really is the beginning of the, the end, even right. though Jefferson okay. Davis refuses to acknowledge that at first. Right. That's a good point. Somebody else pointed out the question that said there is no Civil War peace treaty like at Versailles. After, um, what events officially ended the Civil War or did they? <laughs> It's a great question because we do tend to think about Appomattox as the end, but legally the war remains 
um, it, it remains a state of war until April 2nd, 1866 for every state except Texas. And then in August of 66, Johnson, President Andrew Johnson will declare that the war is officially over there as well. So you know, I, I did a lot of legal history in this book. And one of the really fascinating things to me was because these men are paroled, as long as a state of war, a legal state of war remains, they're protected in a way that they might not be if there's no longer a, a state of war. So in some ways, it's in the best interest of rebels that that this um, legal state continues well into April of 66. Hmm. Interesting, very. Um, so did, did Union troops commit atrocities in Virginia after the surrender? No. And it sounded like you kind of addressed that a little bit, but no. No. No, I mean, Union troops are, they're civilian, they're citizen soldiers. They have signed up and they want to go home and they believe that the war is over as well. And th th even from Appomattox on the, the night of April 9th, looking at letters and diaries from Union soldiers that are, are bivouacked on the field, they're writing home or, or telling their diaries, the war is over. We have saved the union. We can go home immediately. And so they're quite angry that they have this mustering out period that will take them well into late May, into early June. But the, the union armies will be very quickly demobilized. But no, there are not, absolutely, there are not atrocities committed by union troops in the hmm. aftermath. Interesting. Somebody else pointed out that um, how did the surrender at Appomattox Courthouse shape the memory of surrender in Reconstruction? And are there any myths about the surrender that um, are still believed or taught today? There are so many myths that go in different directions. And on one hand, we, we talk about Appomattox as this great moment of reconciliation, that the war ended it was a neat, clean ending that Lee and Grant shook hands and that was the end of the discussion and, and it was one big happy family after that. Mm -hmm. So that's that's one strand of, of memory that holds. But the lost cause to so the, the Confederate best case scenario that will build over the course of, of the 19th century and certainly into the 20th century um, especially by the time you get to the, the 1890s and early 1900s and that next generation to so the children of those who were the war generation, the children of Confederates tend to talk about Appomattox as this, this horrible, def not a, it's not a defeat, but they've been overwhelmed. And it's this sad story when then they see that as the, the beginning of reconstruction and all the, the so-called horrible, terrible things that will happen in reconstruction. So there are these competing memories that that are are very much par, part of the, the popular uh, vernacular and popular culture. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, prior to Appomattox, had Grant previously paroled any Confederate soldiers, such as at, like at Vicksburg, for example, or did they imprison them all? He does. So Grant had overseen two surrenders of entire armies before he gets to Appomattox, which is is quite a triumph in and of itself. So at, he does so at Fort Donelson in February of 1862. Those Confederates will be sent to northern prisoner of war camps. Many of them head, for example, to Camp Douglas in Chicago. But at Vicksburg in July of 1863, Grant will do precisely what he does at Appomattox, and that is parole these soldiers, which for all intents and purposes, and this happens throughout the war, there's there's lots of paroling that goes on on both sides. You might capture a small unit, you might capture four men, and you might parole them on the spot. That means that they go home, or in the case of, of Union soldiers who've been paroled, they get to a camp of parole, and they're to await until they've been exchanged and then they can go and fight again. So it's it's not unusual what Grant did in terms of paroling soldiers and send them home. What was incredibly unique at Appomattox and, and what Grant did that no one else had done was that part of his terms of surrender say that the Confederate soldiers that are paroled will not be disturbed by United States authorities so long as they don't break any laws and order where they live. 
And so this to Confederates, they see this as conferring pardons and it's, it's not a pardon, but this becomes instantly, as soon as news hits Northern newspapers by the morning of April 10th, people are up in arms. Does this mean that, that Lee and others can't be tried for treason? Well, you know, that, that becomes a legal debate of the day. Mm -hmm. That is um, interesting because one of the questions that just came in was, you know, to what extent were the terms of the surrender worked out um, in Petersburg with, between Grant, Lincoln and Grant um, in March of 1865? So I think they're talking about the meeting aboard the the River Queen, where it's it's Grant and Sherman and Porter meeting with, with Lincoln. And Lincoln tells them, number one, you can't deal with political issues. You can only deal with the surrender of the army that's in front of you. And so this means that unlike what Sherman attempts to do, you can't negotiate anything about the status of state governments. That's not on the table. You are a military commander. You negotiate the surrender of the army that you're dealing with. But Lincoln says you need to be as magnanimous as possible. These are our countrymen. And remember, the whole point of the war is union. If your goal is reunion, you don't want these cycles of revenge and retaliation, and that that's only going to to continue war by other means or war by irregular means, I should say. So Lincoln never specifically spells out what Grant or Sherman is supposed to do, but he has has certainly given them his his idea and his um his vision of what this will look like. But he's also done this in his second inaugural address. On March 4th, at the inauguration, he says, with malice toward none, with charity for all. And so we, we see Lincoln's vision of what this post-war union is going to look like. Wow. Well, this has been so edifying, uh, Carrie. I think you're knowledge is just encyclopedic. <laughs> so thank you so much for sharing um, you know, the, your insight into this topic today. And thanks to our audience for sending in so many really good questions. That was, um, I learned a lot even just from the questions. Um, unfortunately, I think we probably need to end because we're pushing up on the 45 minute mark. Um, I hope everybody enjoys your evening. Um, I hope you all join us for a future Destinations and Discoveries talk. And uh, thank you again, Carrie, so much. And um, I'm sure thank we'll speak you. soon. Alrighty. All right, thank you. Good night. Right. Take care, everyone. Good night, everybody.